Hello and welcome to Try Talking Sport, hosted by me, Joanne Murphy. You've come to the right place if you're looking for inspiration, encouragement, motivation and a little bit of entertainment. Whether you are an athlete, adventurer, endurance enthusiast or simply have an interest in sport, thanks for tuning in and being part of our adventure. I hope you're all safe and well and keeping up some level of training where possible. There have been lots more event cancellations over the past two weeks, but hopefully some light at the end of the tunnel here in Ireland has been the extending of the radius for exercise to five kilometres this week. Also, the virtual racing taking place weekly and the multiple mammoth challenges people have taken on to support a variety of causes has been both great for focusing on our own individual training and motivation and also been very uplifting. If you haven't had a chance to tune in to our Facebook Live sessions, be sure to check them out on Try Talking Sport every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8.30pm. We've heard some great stories and had some super insight from the athletes featured each week. If you missed the live shows, you can catch up with the videos posted on the page. Last week, we chatted with Shane Finn, ultra endurance athlete from Kerry, who biked and ran his way across America last year in an epic adventure challenge. We also caught up with Eve McChrystal and Katie George and Levy, who are now living together at Eve's home as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions. You may recall from our podcast episode that Katie had come to Ireland for a couple of weeks training before the restrictions came into play. Find out how they have adjusted to being together 24-7 during the COVID lockdown in Ireland. Last night, we heard from Stephen Donnelly, who last Friday completed an Ironman in his garden, swimming for an hour in a skip. Yes, a skip in his garden before jumping on the turbo and treadmill to complete his challenge in a time of eight hours and 49 minutes. Winner of the La Coutre Castle gauntlet race in Galway, Hardman Ireland and finishing seventh at Ironman Estonia in 2019. He was focused on getting to Lanzarote and the Norseman cross tri championships this year. But these plans have now been put on hold. But he has put his training to great use, raising over €12,000 in the process of completing his lockdown Ironman. Tomorrow night, we welcome Emma Hatzis to the hot seat. The Tri Training Harder athlete raced in the military division of Ironman Bolton last year and became the overall female winner. She will provide some insight into her triathlon success whilst balancing her busy work schedule and her passion to try. Speaking of passion for a triathlon, I am loving being back training a bit more consistently. I think I've managed almost six weeks of training. I even managed five days in a row on the turbo, which, to be honest, hasn't happened in a very long time. And I've also completed three weeks of a boot camp session I do in the garden every day at 4 p.m. This has now replaced my 4 p.m. coffee, but the routine is great and working hard on the turbo is as good for my mind as it is for my body. Last Saturday, I did my longest session on the turbo in ages, a one hour 45 session with Galway Tri Club. It was great crack and a welcome distraction for a spin. And yesterday, the Galway Babes did a lunchtime turbo chatting over Zoom whilst working hard. The company is great and the time flies. I'm hoping to take part in the Ironman virtual challenge this weekend, a 3k run, 40k bike and a 10k run. Fingers crossed I make it to the start line, never mind the finish line. I have to say I'm very much enjoying the training and the routine I've set up for myself at home whilst waiting to get back to what I really love, race announcing. This weekend I will be joining the lineup of guests for the tri show taking place on Saturday, hosted by our friends at Tri Training Harder. The event will take the format of an online conference with a lineup of speakers including leading scientific experts within our field, top UK-based athletes and a host of other guests from the world of triathlon. It is hoped that attendees will be able to take lessons forward not just during COVID-19 but even further into their training. Check out the details on www.trytrainingharder.com. So now to today's show with superstar athlete Sarah Crowley from Adelaide in Australia. Sarah has raced triathlon successfully for a number of years, both on the ITU circuit and more recently, stepping up to middle and long distance triathlon. Going back to work in between racing as an elite on the ITU circuit and as a professional Ironman athlete, she left behind her very successful career in accounting to focus on long distance triathlon and has carved a career in sport that has seen her finish third at the Ironman World Championships in Kona in both 2019 and 2017. She backed up that third place finish in Kona last year with a win at Ironman Arizona just five weeks after her epic battle on the island. A race she says was her best race so far coming away from that event as the fastest Australian in history at Ironman Kona. 
In addition, she has also been crowned champion across a multitude of events, including Ironman 70.3 Santa Cruz in 2019 and 2018, South American Ironman champion 2018, ITU World Long Course champion 2017, Asia Pacific and European Ironman champion 2017. The list of success in sport is seriously impressive. And this snapshot of her achievements is testament to her caliber as an athlete and leader in the sport of triathlon. In this episode, we find out how working with her coach Cam, reconstructing her swim and keeping her support team tight have played a pivotal role in her sporting success on the Ironman circuit. That, added to her dedication, tenacity and commitment to her craft, as well as her joy of triathlon, has seen her on a sporting journey that many of us will only ever dream of. We even managed to speak a bit of Irish in this episode and hopefully one day we will see Sarah come to Ireland or the UK to race an Ironman event. Huge thanks to Jay Luke, my Ironman co-announcer, for setting up this chat with Sarah. Enjoy the show, I certainly enjoyed recording it. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's a Monday morning here in Galway. It's Monday evening, I believe, in Noosa in Australia. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, yeah, so sort of, uh, just finishing up a day here in, in sunny Noosa. It's, um, I'm pretty lucky with where I am at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'd love to share some of the things I've been doing while stuck in uh, lockdown, but um, which is a little less strict here in Australia, fortunately for me. Um, but yeah, great to great to chat. Sarah, tell me, what is life like in Australia at the moment in the midst of the coronavirus? Yeah, so we were a little late to the party in our lockdowns. I think we saw Europe coming on with lockdowns maybe over maybe a couple of weeks in to the end of March maybe and you know we didn't really lock down here until the start first week in April so I saw all that happening in Europe and I was like oh what if I can't swim and yeah the pools started closing at the end of March and I was like well I've got to go do something about this and I know you're not supposed to move around but Noose is only like a two-hour drive for us so I moved up here because there's a lot of athletes and it's a really great facility um in terms of like the you know the natural roads and everything is really awesome and the beaches and stuff and we're still allowed to swim so at the moment I don't think we're as strict as other countries like we're allowed to leave the house whenever we like um you're not allowed to really have people over maybe just one person from or, or I think you can have two people now, two people from another household, but it has to be the same household. And you can exercise wherever you like, except for some of the national parks, but you can't go sit on the beach or anything like that. And you can go riding, but just not in groups. Um, so yeah, it's kind of do everything by twos. Don't really explore too far outside your households. Um, limited numbers in the supermarkets, all the sort of regular shopping is kind of closed but it's not as strict as you must stay in your house and you can't leave a certain area or anything like that. So how has that um, affected your training then? I mean obviously with the pools closed it's probably difficult I mean for everyone I don't know if there's anyone in the world at the moment that's really got a great ability to train and have say their coach and a couple of other athletes with them I mean that would be the ultimate at the moment Um, but for me I can just go down to the Noosa Bay in the beach here where the triathlon's held and it's a really uh, calm beach and so um, yeah, I just get out there pretty early in the mornings and, and get my swimming sorted, you know, when there's less sort of people around that are doing their sort of daily exercise, it's more athletes at that time. So, um, yeah, I get it done out there, which is probably the biggest thing that, I mean, that was the main reason for me moving up here, I think, was just to have access to a, to a water, to water. Um, I feel for people that can't, I've heard now that people haven't swum for a couple of months, um, which is going to really impact not just their swimming, but perhaps even their bike riding, you know, you're in a race, you get out and you haven't, you're probably going to be hurting from that swim if you haven't done a lot. So yeah, that was my biggest factor. Um, other than that, you know, I guess it's just that social sort of isolation, having meetings on the phone or walking, walking meetings with people who can go out and walk to exercise and have a coffee or something. It's, it's just a bit strange. And I, I mean, yeah, like I'm certainly truly lucky to be where I am because we're not as locked down, but yeah, it is weird. <laughs> Sarah, how did you get into triathlon when you started out first? Were you always sporty or was this just a, you saw it somewhere and decided, hey, I might give this a go? Yeah, so for me, um, my background's in, well, I played a lot of sport all through school. So yeah, I was sporty. I probably, I took up swimming when I was really young. Australia, in Australia, it's like yeah, everyone just swims. So it's a, you must learn to swim. It's kind of a thing because we have beaches everywhere and everyone surrounds Everyone lives in Australia, like on the coastal areas. So swimming is a big thing. I played team sports. Uh, when I went to high school, I ran early morning running. 
Um, so I sort of developed, I wasn't very good at it, but I, I developed a bit of an engine then. And, you know, into sort of adolescence, I was probably doing more team sports, like softball, basketball, things like that. But then when I went to sort of the back end of my university years, I watched a short aquathon at the beach in Adelaide, my hometown, and just thought it was super cool. So then I pretty much signed up for a tri club the next day. Um, and it took me a while, but after about three or four years, I was a race world series for Australia. Um, I think all the running background just really helps. Um, and then after my swim wasn't that great. And so after a few years of trying to sort of reach, you know, like you can race that level, but if you're really not in the game, if you're not in the front pack in the swim and trying to improve the swim was just such a big effort. And I ended up going back to work because meanwhile I sort of had studied to be an accountant. And so I went back to work and race longer course, maybe half distance and non-drafting triathlon on the weekends. And then my current coach sort of in about 2016 returned from cycling. Um, he was a director of a cycling team. And so he was keen to start coaching triathlon. He had, his background was in triathlon and, and a very strong swimming coach. So for me, it was like, well, let's give it one more go. And so I had a crack and then, yeah, we improved. I mean, I went backwards, but we improved a heap and that's sort of what led to kind of my improvement in performance over the last four years, which was just mind blowing for me. <laughs> How crucial was that decision to go with Cam as a coach to get to where you uh, are today? Yeah, I mean, it was it was pivotal. I'd known Cam right back from the early days. So Cam had, he was with Brett Sutton and uh, around the time that say uh, Chrissy Wellington was with, with Brett. And also earlier than that, when Brett was in Australia with Loretta Harrop, Emma Snowsill and all these other athletes that were coming through at that really high level even in short course. And Cam was in the squads around that time. So he'd witnessed the coaching methodologies and he still coaches within the tri framework now, but um, he's definitely a very skilled coach. And when I met him as an athlete, when he still was an athlete in probably about 2000 eight or nine just doing some open water swimming stuff I just sort of I knew that he would be a really good coach one day but yeah and then he actually mentioned to me when I was finishing up I'd asked asked him in a message on Facebook so long ago how I got a how to get an Ironman license or something back in like 2009 or 10 or something and he's like oh I know a guy you should go to who help you with your swimming and and get you sorted kind of thing and I was like I just fobbed it off but that was probably Brett at the time you know and then I just went and did my thing and then when it just happened that when I was in 2015 I was racing all this variety of distances and having a larger variety of results between being successful in sort of shorter stuff and then going overseas and racing Ironmans and half distance and duathlons and all this stuff I decided that I needed a coach and just happened that Cam was then finishing up in his role as the director of a cycling team in Australia and I thought, well, that's brilliant because I knew his swimming background. So, yeah, it kind of just, it really gelled really well together right from the start. And you raced on the ITU circuit, of course, as well um, for, for quite a while, tried to get to London, but you got injured trying to get to the Olympics. Yeah, like I had, it was really strange. It was probably some sort of like a labral problem, but we never really diagnosed it. It was, I kept getting pain in the front of my hip joint and it wasn't clear if that was like tendinopathy, if it was like a stress reaction in my femur or if it was like a labral tear or anything like this. And in the end, um, I did a race in 2010. It was probably my last real ITU race in Wellington. It was the Oceana Cup and I did quite well, but after the race, I couldn't even walk. Within the week or something, the partner at Deloitte was like, when are you thinking about coming back? Because I was on a leave of absence for like two years. Uh, and I was thinking, oh, well, this is probably my decision point. So yeah, I mean, the thing is that, you know, the reality of that was that I could have beaten around the bush for another few years trying to race ITU um, and I would have gone well enough because I had pretty good results in continental level uh, and things, but I was never going to improve unless I'd really addressed the swimming problem. So you went back to work for a while, didn't you? Yeah, so um, during my development as a triathlete, while I was still living in Adelaide, I was studying, well, I'd studied accounting at uni and then I went and I'd worked for Deloitte um, and I'd shifted into corporate finance. And yeah, so I pretty much could go back to that role. Like they were so supportive of me trying to pursue my best in try. Um, and so, yeah, I just pretty much went back to Deloitte and thrown into the mining boom in Queensland to do quite a number of significant kind of international mining transactions. And then 
took a little bit of time out of Deloitte again to work for General Electric, actually, in mining to do some stuff in post-merger integration, all this stuff. And meanwhile, I was still kind of racing uh, half-distance triathlon on the weekends. I'd go into my boss's office and I'm going to go to South Korea for a race or <laughs> so it was kind of like a little bit awkward with work, but they always understood. Um, I always pulled my weight, so it didn't really matter. But I was definitely burning the candle at both ends. And by about 2015, it was just – I'd actually returned to Deloitte um, then as a director. And by then, it was kind of the time to go, well, do you really want to have another go at this or not? Yeah. So then you moved into the long stuff and your first year in Kona, you finished 15th in 2016. Yeah. So take us through the journey from, from 2016 right through to, to, I suppose, 2019. I was looking at your results. Wow, it's just like champion, first place, champion, champion, second place, third <laughs> place, champion. It's incredible the career that you've created in triathlon since, I suppose, really going pro full time. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I remember writing a post really early on when I joined with Cam about how I was so sick of getting fourth. And I mean, I think that can sound a little bit r sort of obnoxious to people because I know it isn't a great result. But for me, it was kind of frustrating because I knew that I could do much better than that. And I knew I could be on the podium. I could be challenging for the races, but I was just always off or short because of, you know, I just was unprofessional, I guess. Like I wasn't, I didn't have enough time while I was working to kind of do all the things required to race at that level. It was totally frustrating for me because I knew from my background in ITU that I could do much more. Um, yeah, and so basically in 16, when I joined with Cam, we reconstructed my swim stroke. I remember going to the pool and I, for the first three months or four months of 16, I still worked at Deloitte full time. And in that time, we didn't really do a lot more than just getting me up to the level of being able to deal with a full time training load. And then when I finished work, um, yeah, the first thing we went, I remember going to the valley pool and Cam just re-engineering my stroke one day and I was just like, oh, this is terrible and I swam so slow. It must have been around the, uh, I think it was around April 2016 or something because it was must have been around the Luke Harrop triathlon here on the Gold Coast. And I remember doing a swim set that week and I was I couldn't even swim like 145 with all my gear on for 100 meters in the pool like it was terrible um and so I just like I just accepted it it was a totally different swim stroke I just had to I didn't we didn't change a little bit here or a little bit there in my mind it's almost a different stroke so I could go and swim what I used to swim and swim this stroke and it's like butterfly to freestyle you know and so I felt I knew I just was going to commit to it see where it took me see what happened and I really just I didn't think too much about it after that. I didn't stress about it. I just did it. And then I raced in New Caledonia that year and I got out and I didn't swim any faster or slower than I'd had before. And I thought, well, we're not going backwards. So this is, I'm just going to stick with it from here. And I had a quite a good race and the rest of the race panned out pretty well because I didn't use as much effort in the swim. And so I thought, well, look, I think we're onto something, but you know, who knows? And so that year I just sort of tuck it away doing all the training and I still hadn't trained full time at that point for six years so I was a long way behind in my development even with strength and endurance and all these things that even some of the people that I train with now have probably had at that point if they when they've joined camp much more time as a professional athlete and so I had like this massive amount of I guess capacity that we could tap into that we just hadn't developed yet. And so I guess we just spent the, that 16 year, I was quite lucky because I spent most of the time with Cam, a lot of training camps with Cam. He didn't have a lot of other athletes. So it was full time work. And I think I did Cairns and I might have been third at Cairns in the regional championship. You know, it was sort of unremarkable. Like, I feel like, yeah, we'd gone a bit better, but it, it was still not quite there. Um, the run wasn't very good. And I just, yeah, I just wasn't that happy with it. And then we went to another camp. I think I must have qualified for 70.3 worlds actually that year. I can't remember where, but nonetheless, after Cairns, we went to Park City, Utah and trained in altitude for a little bit. So once again, it's like a full-time camp with Cam. And off the back of that, I had a, quite a good performance in Cebu and I was like, yeah, things are coming together. And then came back, raced the 70.3 worlds. It wasn't a great race. Went to Jeju for pre-Kona camp that year. Got pneumonia absolute mess all I did at Kona that year was I think 15th is okay in debut but I had no pressure on me at that point so I just watched out see how the race panned out and learned a lot about it and there's still things that I learned from that experience 
they're just like so good that I would the things I take in every year to the race that I learned at that point where I had no pressure on myself. And I feel like, you know, I, I learned about the race. Did I really want to go back to this? Did I think it's something that I would suit me? Was it something that I could perform well at in the future? Um, so I kind of learned a lot about it and then came back, didn't have a long break. Uh, and then we did a really, really hard swim block. And then I went and raced in Bahrain and I got out and I remember Joe Spindler saying 30 or 40 seconds to Caroline and I was like whoa hang on a minute this has never happened before she's not very far up the road at all like that's a hard effort for 10ks on the bike and with that I just realized this this was actually we were actually starting to make some gains in the swim and so um I ended up winning that as a regional championship uh, in Bahrain 70.3 and you know, it was probably a pretty good run performance as well. So the swim wasn't impacting the run and the ride anymore. And then we went, had a break, had a proper break. And then 17 just went off with a bang. Like I, I probably stripped off a little bit of weight safely. Then we went we went and did New Caledonia again. And I got out with like Annabelle Luxford and Barbara Riveros, who were short course athletes. I mean, Barbara had just done the Olympics in 16. And I even outran them and it had just such a great race. And then we went to Cairns and then I won Cairns and then it was like, wait a minute, things are going really good. And then you believe and you learn how to win as well. So, and then Cam didn't give me much time to think about that. He gave me three or four weeks. He's like, we're going to go to do Frankfurt. And I went into Frankfurt with just like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Um, I've just done an Ironman. I don't even know if I can back an Ironman up. And so then we went and did Frankfurt and when I won Frankfurt and then it was like, okay, hang on a minute. So then we went to Park City again and did another couple of months of hard training and then I went and won Pendington World Title. And all of this is off the back of just coming out in that front swim pack, which I'd never had the chance to do. And it was just so much effort. It was like a year or more of hard effort into – and I know people put in effort into their swim. They are all – everyone is all the time and they want to make changes. But we changed it so dramatically that, you know, we got a really different outcome. And then, um, yeah, so following that we went to Kona and I was pretty cooked in 17 mentally. Like the year was huge. You can imagine uh, all of that going through your mind, these massive improvements and this new level of athlete that you are. And so – yeah, I mean, I just did what I had to do that day. I wasn't really – I didn't really draw too much into the, the actual event because I was pretty exhausted. Um, but, yeah, I had a really good race and got third at Kona. And then, um, yeah, into 18 I got a stress fracture, which is common in people that have this performance gain and you, like, think you need to be at that level immediately when you start training again. And so 18 was a bit slower, but, you know, we still had some really good results with, you know, one Hamburg and Argentina and a few other things and six at Kona and then uh, – yeah, and then this year, this year being 19 last year, we, we sort of approached it a little differently and we went after a few of the top athletes in big hitouts to try and sort of lift the level up a bit more because we knew Kona was going to be even harder this year with us. You know, the, the athletes are just getting, girls are just getting so fast now. So, you know, we raced Lucy, we raced Holly Lawrence, um, I raced Teresa Adam in their ultimate scenarios and just try and see if I could learn something from that that we could then use at Kona. And yeah, and then we went ahead and went to Kona and had another really good result. Uh, it was probably my best race I've ever had so far in my life. So I was really pleased with it. And the cool thing is there's still stuff that we can work on. I'm still pretty, still feel like I haven't had my best run. So yeah. And now it's COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it's COVID. <laughs> I love oh, the way we you just throw that in there. That too, you did, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so not only did you come third in Kona in 2019, but you backed it up a month later with a win at Ironman Arizona, which I'm going to come back to because yes, yeah. you've said so much in that piece there about your yeah. career and you just kind of batted it off like it was just, you know, this, <laughs> that and the other and whatever. But there's so much comes out of, of what you've just said, Sarah, because the first thing is how important it is to back yourself going into races and to be confident and obviously improving your swim and coming out so quickly behind Caroline in Bahrain must have given you an ultimate confidence boost within the race itself that geez I'm able to hit it with the big girls now and, and I'm going to be able to catch her and, and to do very well here today. Yeah it was amazing how that was kind of the first time where I'm like oh hang on and then you know I guess I raced that Luke Harrop memorial race um, and got out with all the ITU girls I was like what this is weird and then once again yeah like I said you're getting out with your Annabelles and things in New Caledonia I mean I was still a bit behind but it was very obvious that things were improving and then by Kona I was in the front pack on Annabelle's feet 
like it's just such a quick rise with the swimming. But at the same time that that's all happening, I'm building this engine that I hadn't really had the opportunity to work on since I worked was full time back in 2010. So, you know, you see a lot of athletes perhaps like um, you know, your Daniellas and Annie Hargs and those things, they come up and they come in, they bang, they're good. But they've come off of Olympic programs and they're already high performing athletes. So for me, if I if you just took out those five years and glued it together, then it would probably be very sort of similar and maybe not not notice as a big sort of improvement as much. But yeah, like that working period of time really uh, you know, I guess we just had to work through improving again and uh, getting stronger and everything that, you know, you lost a bit of, I just lost a bit of strength and endurance and everything else by working full time. And when you're going back to re-engineering or reconstructing a, a swim and you're taking it back to the very, very basics of it, did you get frustrated about the you not seeing the gains or did you get frustrated about going what and go why are we doing this like I'm not getting any faster you know before the results started to come because a lot of us will give up before we see the results coming in so what was it was it just the consistent training and the commitment that you gave I to think, yourself I think I had the luxury of my coach being there every day and not having a lot of outside influence with other athletes so he was setting the time cycles and I'd forgotten what time cycles even meant because I'd been working full time and just the best I could get was nine Ks a week or something at the pool. So for me to have that environment where there was no, I didn't know any different. I just did what I was told. Um, I felt like I was achieving every time I'd finish a swim set. Um, and so I, and we were always kind of tweaking things as they improved. I just didn't really ever get stressed about it. I don't know. I feel like there was no alternative. So it was either this or it was done. So it was kind of, I just stuck with it really. Um, That first day I did it, that was the choice. Like it was down on the Gold Coast swimming alone and swimming so slow and feeling so uncomfortable. And that was the moment where it was a choice between do I do it like this or do I just give it up and go back to what I was doing and do it all. You know, I've seen with other athletes that he's made, Cam's very good at making changes, but perhaps little change here, little change there. And I think that maybe would take longer. Like what we did was like go a lot further backwards, but to come a lot further forward in the long run. Mm. There's um, there's a lot of athletes that will say that they're uncoachable, that they want to write their own program and ride their own race and things like that. What do you think makes you such a coachable athlete? Do you trust the process, trust the people around you? Yeah, like I trust my team. You don't come into my team if I don't trust you and that's like just how it works. So, um, yeah, it's vice versa as well. And like if you can't communicate well and give good feedback and be direct and and everything else, then, you know, that's that's how I work and how I operate. Coming from an accounting background, it's, it's all about, um, yeah, I guess actioning, actioning things and getting them done. And if you can't do them, there's usually some reason why and talking about that. So really it's straightforward. Um, and I spent a lot of effort trying to just cut back on noise, really. Um, it was a big challenge for me when the group grew bigger because I'd have to then have other people around and it's not any fault of mine or Cam's, he needs to co- coach them. They could be better athletes uh, under his coaching as well. And, um, you know, really I just try and find ways for me to kind of do my own thing and only really train with very few people. Um, and, you know, it's usually in certain sessions only as well because I, I just want to action everything as it's prescribed and move on for the day. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I just, I'm just compliant basically. <laughs> I don't really argue too much, yeah. <laughs> But I think that's important as well, because if you're going to invest the time in a coach and a coach is going to invest in you, you've got to trust them and you've got to take the feedback that they give you and obviously give them feedback too. But, um, you know, it's it's funny how some athletes will come out and say, like Lucy Gossage will say she's not a coachable athlete uh, herself. Mm. We, we did a podcast recently where she said, uh, I'm I'm uncoachable. So she's kind of written her own program and her own plan uh, for the years that she wow. was racing professionally. Um, but I want to come back to Kona 2019 and I'm sure you've spoken lots and lots about Kona Mm -hmm. but you had such a confidence boost going into that race because you won the whole swim uh, before the race oh yeah I did so that (laughs) must have been um, I suppose a little bit surreal for you but also a nice little boost going into the 2019 championships 
Yeah, that, you know when you have achievements in your life that people probably don't realize how much how much they mean to you, and that was kind of one of those little one of those days where you're just like, wow, we really have made some big changes here. Like to get out on the feet of people like Tim Dawn and the men's pack in that swim was a really uh, yeah, it was just mind blowing. Um, and so, yeah, I put that as a life achievement. I mean, I've been learning another language, which is not good. No, I'm not good at learning languages. And I put it right up there with those personal achievements that are beyond the things that everyone sees that you just go, hmm, yep, that's great. So, yeah, look, I mean, that did, that boosted me definitely. And, you know, I guess at the end of the day, maybe the result at Kona for me came down to how far we were kind of behind out of the swim. Unfortunately, we didn't, the pack that I was in let Lucy off too far, um, which is ironic, but yeah, like, yeah, it's, it, it, that was definitely awesome going in, but, uh, you know, the business end is the following week for sure. I mean, we just moved on after that, but, um, yeah, it did, did make me feel a bit more comfortable about being there. <laughs> Uh, so talk me through the race. Lucy was obviously out of the water um, ahead of, of the second pack that were coming out. And then uh, there was quite a quite a lot of activity going on on the bike course. Lucy was up the front on her own for quite a bit. There was no sign of Daniela coming through. And then heading into T2, you were a little bit behind uh, the leading charge for the bike course, but you held your own and you were right up there in the mix coming into T2. And of course, that piece with Lucy, that critical piece on the run back towards Elite Drive, towards the finish line. Yeah, so, I mean, Lucy benefited from a, a choppier swim this year. We normally turn the swim boy or the, the boat and it's uh, that gap, whatever that's formed, usually stays kind of the same because there's a bit of a current maybe that comes back in, but it was different this year and that gap was maybe an extra couple of minutes. Um, I don't think it would have impacted the chase on the bike. The gap would have been whatever it was in the end, but, yeah, definitely, I mean, we formed a pretty strong ride group and everyone shared it around and then towards the end of the ride, Blymill and Laura Phillip joined our group. It was a pretty strong group. Yeah, I mean, there were some moves going on in that group. Um, Blymill went to the front and Carrie Lester almost missed that jump. That could have been a broken off Annie because I went real hard past carry because she just got dropped basically she wasn't she got dropped she just wasn't watching for it and then um it strung the group out and Imogen was in front of Annie at that point and Imogen was like a few hundred meters back down the road with Annie behind her and had to pull up uh, to get back into the group so that could have changed the outcome of the race but people probably don't see that and I didn't even really know what was happening all I knew was I needed to get around carry or there'd be drama yeah and then we came in and you know I had a really smooth transition and I guess it's the way it is in Kona, everything's fast. I got out onto the run leg and about a K and Annie came past and I was like, you know, you rode really strong, good on you. And she went off running as fast as she was running and I was just like, well, I can't run that fast right now and who knows if she's going to hold that pace, that's quick, and if she does, then she'll be the Ironman champion. It just was reality. So I kept running, really felt great, like unbelievably good. And then heading into the energy lab, you can start to see motorbikes and things. And out of the corner, I could see motorbikes. I'm like, what's going on here? And then next minute, I'm like running running back in the in the energy labs, Annie, and just like next to – just past Lucy. And Annie's like – I think she said something like you can catch her too or something like that. She was being really like really nice. And I'm like, yeah, I can. And so I probably turned on a bit of a turbo head and started chasing um, Lucy a little bit too fast maybe. And then when we got back up onto the Queen K, I was going through the aid stations and I probably wasn't taking as much nutrition as I should have. And in the end, I looked down at about 35 Ks and I didn't have any gels left in my little pouch. And I'd forgot, your mind's a bit mushy and I'd forgotten that uh, that there was some cliff blocks in my back pocket. And so, yeah, I just hadn't eaten enough food. And by the time I caught up to Lucy, I passed her. And, and I just didn't – there was no um, acceleration or surge or anything like this. I just ran past her and I was like, that's not right. I shouldn't have done that. I should have thought about this, like settled in before I caught her. I just ran past her. It was really strange. And then I didn't really have a lot of say in it. My body was doing what it was doing. And then um, – I didn't realize until afterwards when I saw a photo, but I actually got a fair way up the road ahead of her, but I felt like she was right on my shoulder. I approached the climb up to Palani and I, my legs just died. And it's just one of those rough patches. It was only a 430 kilometer. Like it's, we're not talking about blowouts or anything like that. It probably looked worse than it was on TV. But I mean, I ran today uh, over a hill and I probably shuffled a little bit like it, you know, and you just wouldn't notice normally, but it was just a critical point in the race and and Lucy pulled herself together and she ran past and I just couldn't respond and nor did I want to because if I responded too hard, I feel like I wouldn't have even made it to the finish at that point. You just right on the rivet. Um, 
to get to that point, I was running on a 257 marathon pace in Hawaii, which is pretty fast. So, yeah, it was pretty much the extremes of what I was able to cope with. Um, yeah, so in the end, I'm stoked with my performance, but I still feel like there's more, there's definitely more in my run. And I'm really keen to kind of, you know, that's my pursuit now <laughs> is to get that run down to what I'm capable of. That result in uh, in Kona, I know it was third and you had been third in 2017, but it's almost like a memorable piece. I, I don't know what it is about that particular performance. Maybe it was the pass with Lucy. Maybe it was the bravery to just go for it. I don't know, but mm. it's something that I suppose a lot of us looked at and went, wow, fair play to her. And here, uh, I think I was actually in Alicante at the time and it was the middle of the night and I was watching it. I fell asleep and I woke up and you were just after passing Lucy. I was like, I can't mm. go back to sleep. I have to keep watching it but I think it, it was Brilliant. pivotal and uh, you know a, a fantastic performance for you but then to back up that performance in Kona with a win at Ironman Arizona again another stacked field of athletes what was it it was the the end of November so it was what five weeks after Kona I mean talk me through that race and what it was like out of I the mean, Kona the, bubble yeah like the next day I went swimming and I was like oh wow I'm feeling okay. This is weird. Um, recovering well. Um, <laughs> so I had to make a decision that day if I'd do the Noosa triathlon. I'm like, yeah, why not? Let's go do Noosa. Noosa's fun. And I was on the start list for Arizona as a backup if I had a bad race at Kona. And I just did Noosa and I found myself 500 meters from the finish racing an ITU athlete, Natalie Van Coveden, for like a spot on the podium. It was me versus second versus third. And I'm like, what is going on? I didn't have the kick. She ran off and I got third again. But, um, yeah, like I saw that and I'm like, well, I'm okay here. I'm feeling fine. And then I was like, Cam, you think we should just go do it and co get Kona off the table? And Because uh, that same day that the Noosa try finished, I had to decide on whether I'd stay on the start list. We knew the PTO stuff was coming. We knew that we, maybe we needed to be more flexible for 2020. We didn't know this would happen with COVID, but we did know that it'd be good to have it qualified and sorted. So, yeah, I just went. And I knew I was in good nick. I always go better on my second Ironman, which is weird, but it just works for me. Um, and that this last year, I mean, I did – Roth and um, I did Cairns, which wasn't great, and then Roth, which was better, and then I did Kona, which was great. But I didn't feel better for Arizona, but I was still very conditioned and fine for the race. But afterwards, I knew that was it. I was done. My body started playing games, and I was like a little bit just kind of you go into a bit of adrenal fatigue, and it's a proper stress on your body. So, yeah, I went in with a really just to smash it as long as I could and try and stay away and uh, – hope that Heather's legs would feel pretty similar to mine because she had just done Kona as well. So I had a really great bike ride um, and then uh, just just survived the run. But it wasn't a bad run. I think it was maybe a 301 or something like this. But, yeah, I mean, people have typically run there very quick. Um, so compared to the comparative times, it wasn't a super fast run. But, yeah, I was pretty happy with the result and set, set up this year that I guess didn't go to plan. But... <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> yeah, Arizona is uh, is fabulous. I had actually been there that week for the Outspoken Women in Try Summit and uh, had just come home as they were building the Ironman course over there. Do you think that there was less pressure maybe going into Arizona than there was going into Kona and that maybe that's why you had a better performance or result? Or does the pressure get to you at all, Sarah? Um, No, like I find that pressure is only what you put on yourself. And so Kona this year was probably the one of the first sort of uh, – well, the first year I didn't know what I was doing and I just went. And then the second year I was so exhausted I didn't really notice and I just eliminated myself from a lot of the, the stresses of it. 2018 I probably got a bit too involved in things and, you know, probably – but then this last year, it was all business and I got off the plane and I just knew I was there to do a job. And, you know, we've got things pretty dialed now with the media and that. Like we pretty much set out a schedule – and if you're not on it by the time we leave Australia, you're not probably going to get a lot of time with me. And we make sure that that's the case and that I didn't even go down to the race venue until maybe the Thursday or the Friday before, like the Thursday before, like two days before the race was the first time I even saw the the finish line at Kona. Um, we stay in a place where we can sort of be nearby enough, but not close enough that we see it um, every day and there's ways of avoiding it and that just keeps the stress levels down. You're not sort of in that big festive environment. Um, but really it's a process for me. You know, I go to Arizona and I was there to do a job and, yeah, I actually quite like that feeling of it being a, you know, task-oriented type event. Um, yeah, and I guess 
you know, you celebrate and you enjoy the moment after the race. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's a mindset. It's just how I operate. Uh, I want to do everything the best I can. And that just sort of takes a lot of concentration. And yeah, that's why my team's pretty tight and know how I operate. And we just eliminate as much outside influences as possible. In terms of your career, Sarah, what would you say has been, I know you say Kona this year or 2019 was one of your best performances, but what would you say is one of the highlights of your career to date? Oh, racing in the Bahamas uh, in, in the Island House try. That was pretty awesome. I had a terrible race. I raced so, I raced so badly, but I it was short course. It was awful. But no, I had a, a super good time. And I guess it was kind of like a celebration of maybe reaching a new level in my career. Um, I didn't really feel like I should have been there because I didn't race very well, but it was probably to be expected after the, the year I had in 17. Um, you know, like maybe Argentina, I had a super good race there, um, but no one really saw because it was in Argentina and wasn't covered probably as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many highlights. I love going to different locations and racing the big races in, in like unique places. So I've had a lot of experiences like that. Um, and that sort of keeps me going a bit, just the uh, the enjoyment of racing at the highest level in, in you know, in the, the privilege of being able to do that in some of these amazing places around the world. Do you ever look back at your career, back to your ITU days, and wish that you had the swim strength and knowledge that you have now that you had that back uh, then and what a different career it might be? Or are you happy with all of your fantastic achievements? Well, I'm super happy with where I'm at now, but I don't know if I'd be in the sport where I'm now. So I feel like if I'd done that, I, you know, maybe there would have been a different outcome for sure because I was a lot, a lot faster then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it would have been very different. But, you know, it is what it is and you, you just – I've had other things that I've enjoyed and experienced over the last 10 years that um, I wouldn't have had I gone into into the short course, stayed in the short course um, as much. And, yeah, so I'm just I'm just proud of everything I've done so far and it's, a, it's all – you know, it's all a journey and everyone has a different life and, yeah, yeah, of course it would have been lovely to see maybe what – and I always feel that when I go do Noosa Try and you're racing against the short course girls and – yeah, it would be interesting to know, but then I've really, really enjoyed what I've been doing and I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing now had I stayed in short course for longer. I definitely wouldn't be uh, in the sport as long as I am now. So you take the good with the bad, I guess, and you make your choices. You talk about the highlights um, and there have been many of your career, but talk to me about some of the lowlights or some of the, the stuff that really just you want to forget about or maybe that wasn't so enjoyable about racing and training. Yeah, like in Yokohama in 2009, my chain slipped off my bike in a race where it wasn't a big field and I probably would have run through the race and had an okay performance and that probably cost me a world championship spot on the Gold Coast that year. Um, that was just like really bad. I was just so upset. Um, and and then you, I guess, how do you deal with that disappointment then, Sarah? Well, at the time I didn't have as much experience as I do now and I was just really upset. Like it it probably just meant that the next race was a bit, a bit of a spiral and then, you know, you come back and you have to really regroup. Um, I was a bit young then. Nowadays, I guess most of the things that go wrong are because we've had like a not a good lead in and I've learned from that. Like, you know, if I have a race where I'm not happy with the performance, an example would have been probably Frankfurt in 2018. That was directly off the back of a stress fracture, but there were a lot of things that didn't go to plan leading into that race, not just the fracture, but, you know, just my preparation and my uh, application to what I needed to do to be at the best level. And we addressed it with direct, <laughs> we had a pretty direct conversation about it and those things, you know, you move on and you address them. But yeah, I guess what I learned from that as well is if I pretty much trust Cam's judgment now on what races I need to be doing to be at the right form at the right times of year. And I don't really argue too much. And I'll say things that I maybe places or races that I want to do, but uh, he has to me, I will, even though I have the ultimate say he's, if he thinks it should be something else, I'd rather go with that option because I trust what he's, his ideas and how he thinks he can get me in the right shape. And yeah, it's just, I think, you learn those things as you develop with your coach. Um, but I haven't had a lot of terrible experiences. I just, I mean, I don't, I don't really, uh, yeah. I mean, you have terrible experiences with some of the travel and losing bags and those kind of things, but you know, that's not major. They're not big things in life. They're just part of the course. And yeah, I've had a great career. I really enjoy it. I love what I do. I'm, I'm very lucky to do what I do. And why do you love it so much? 
Well, I think because every day when you train, you feel like you're still about 12 years old because you get to <laughs> swim, ride and run and they're the basic things that you would always do when you're a kid. So, um, yeah, it, I think it keeps you young and I think that's why I enjoy it so much. Um, and then I guess getting the best out of yourself every day, you learn something new that you could improve and, yeah, just always working towards being better. I think that's pretty cool too. And what is your favourite session across swim, bike and run? So the, the cam sets you a session and you go, oh, my God, I don't want to do this one. I hate this. But what are your favorites? If you put me um, in a cane field or a really hot environment and give me an interval session that's like two hours running, that's just me. I just love that. It's, it's, a, it's a bit narcissistic. Is that the word? No, or sadistic mas- even. Sadistic, masochist. Yeah, it's something like this. I love hurting myself <laughs> at running. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, ask any runner. They know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Putting yourself into the hurt locker. Yeah, 100% in the box. Um, that's probably my favorite session. Yeah. And most thing I dislike, there's this run I do. Sometimes we do these bike sessions where we have like a double bike day and some swimming and you end and it's so hard. And then it's like a 30-minute jog off the bike. And I'm just like, what's even the point in this run? I just really – it's just a joke now between me and Cam about how much I dislike that run. <laughs> but you know what? The more I complain about it, the more I'm getting fitter and fitter. It's like a little bit of a sign for me that things are going good. So they're, they're my two uh, goods and bads, I guess, on the training front. And are you getting to rest more or recover more now, Sarah? I suppose there isn't a race goal to later in the year. Are you getting more downtime now? Or are you utilising the time you have in Noosa to get a bit more rest and recovery in? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I guess being up here and away from the squad and not needing to drive anywhere, I'm having a little bit more time during the day to to kind of recover around the training sessions. But we're really doing quite a significant amount of training. One key change to my training at the moment is that we're having a full day off each week, which I don't normally do. Usually it's a random day off every 10 or 11 days. So pretty much to give me some routine to have a bit more of a normal life for a little bit um, because we don't know when we're going to race and it's nice to have that you can you know maybe have a drink on a Saturday night and wake up a little later on Sunday and it's you know it's kind of just a bit more balanced I think but yeah we're training normally here so yeah it's it, it's just hard with no in, no foresight to when we're going to race next. You mentioned earlier that you're learning a new language what are you learning? Oh German yeah so I've sort of been on to that for the last few years you'll notice a few of my sponsors they're all pretty much German so I've got a lot of German contacts now and yeah I've been self-taught so it's been a little bit difficult but I'm coming along and I can finally this year it's amazing when it just clicks and I can watch German TV shows as long as there's German subtitles so I can read the German uh, I can understand most part of the TV show or the movie so it's That's a big step up for me. Um, Still a long way from conversational or anything, but I can understand things a lot more now. And yeah, that's kind of a big achievement for me because I'm not a language person at all. Um, Yeah, I'm probably a little more creative and... Yeah, so languages has always been a bit of a struggle. <laughs> we won't uh, we won't teach you any Irish today, so will we? <laughs> oh dear. In Irish, uh, thank you is Gorevma Agot. Gorevma Agot. Gorevma Agot. That was very good. <laughs> I won't remember it. I think Gar- phonetically I can copy things. I won't remember it. <laughs> Gorev Magat. And then when we eventually get to meet, we'll be able to have a pint of Guinness or a glass of whiskey and to say cheers, we'll say slauncha. Slauncha. Yeah, that was very impressive. Mike Riley would be very impressed with that, Sarah Crowley. <laughs> Oh, I have to remember to say it to him. (laughs) Um, I'm going to finish up uh, very shortly, but I just wanted to ask one kind of final question, I suppose. Lots of people will be looking up to you, you know, athletes, uh, professional athletes, as well as age group athletes, people looking to get into the sport. And they're inspired by what you've done. And for many of us coming into the sport, swimming is our biggest barrier to entry. But the question I have for you is who would be your inspiration to continue your triathlon journey and your sport who inspires you the most oh look I mean I think these days I'm inspired by just the I'm inspired by a lot of the age groupers really like I go to events like in Arizona it really occurred to me that okay there's people like Elle who had lost you know like 100 kilos and finishes a triathlon towards the end of the evening but works just as hard as I do and 
um, you know, it's it's those people, and it's like your Roderick uh, and your CJ Tomlinson, and those guys that don't, you know, they're dis- disabled, but they still manage to get through an Ironman. You know, I guess I have sporting heroes I've always looked up to. You know, your Emma Snowzills from Australia with Try and Il Garouge and all these fantastic runners and swimmers and Grant Hackett and all these people. You know, those people with those stories, I think nowadays are the ones that really inspire me the most because it hurts the same for everyone we just go a bit faster but the training you have to do is pretty much the same um i mean maybe we do a little bit more but it all feels the same to everyone the challenge is the same and so those guys are doing it despite such massive disadvantage and disabilities or setbacks and and you think well if they can do it i can do it and so i think yeah i look to those guys nowadays and they're very inspiring and very motivating for me you also mention um quite frequently during our chat about your team and about how tight your team is and you mentioned Cam quite a lot within your own family unit um, how important is the support of your family to your success? Backing my choices from my family has been probably the biggest thing that you know I've stepped away from a role as an accountant full-time you know I've decided to go up to Noosa and just train Um, I go away frequently to training locations around the world and like I don't go to everyone's wedding I don't go to funerals even I don't go to I miss a lot of things the sacrifices are huge and the fact that they understand that without question without uh, judgment or anything like that they know how important it is to me to to reach my best yeah it's just it's unbelievable and yeah without the team that I have you know I've got quite a good I've obviously got cams and awesome coach and I've got a good PR team and people that sort of understand that that noise has to be kept to a minimum um but we need to look professional um my training partners are selected pretty tightly and and stuff it keeps things uh yeah really professional and really yeah really straightforward and I can just focus on training and racing And do you have a race day mantra, Sarah? Oh, gosh. Stay calm. (laughs) It's only something I guess I've developed since working with Cam, but it was something he's like, you know, you've really got to just chill out. And obviously working in accounting firms, everything's high paced. And I mean, you know, I guess I've got a really big capacity to get through a lot of stuff and I'm always thinking and, and everything else. And nowadays, though, it's funny because I can get a feeling when people are getting a little bit maybe they're tired or maybe they're not happy with their day or something like that and have a way of somehow maybe diffusing the vibe and just chilling out. And I think um, that's something that's sort of learnt over a lot of time that, you know, those you start to kind of build, buy into those scenarios and fire up situations and that's when things get missing or things get forgotten or you don't follow the process correctly and just staying calm in those moments when things can matter is is really important and so stay calm is there's probably other things that go through my mind but overarching that's the vibe in my head when I'm going to a race it's just keep it keep everything real simple stay calm and go when the gun goes off (laughs) go and chase down those toes I think it's now coming up it's probably past your bedtime in Noosa at the moment is it what time is it in Australia right now it's almost 10 o'clock it's 9 40 49 so yeah it's a little late for me but that's okay I'll um I don't have anywhere too far to be in the morning so I'll um yeah I'll just sleep in a little bit and get up get up tomorrow and get the training done and before we finish up actually I want to ask you would you ever consider coming over to Ireland or the UK to race with us over here or is it a little bit too chilly oh unfortunately for me my races do not go well in the cold I'm just such a warm-blooded person like that's I mean it's such a huge advantage when I go race Kona is that I don't sweat much I don't drink much here I like I, I don't I just don't have any drama I don't burn I just go good in the heat I love running in the heat so I would love to but maybe for the duathlon or if we had a heat, or if we got a heat wave. Yeah, if you got a heat wave, what is that? Like twenty five degrees. That'd be hot for you guys, wouldn't it? Yeah, twenty five degrees might be a little hot. Although I did race in um I did race a couple of races where it was like thirty two and thirty four degrees, which is quite hot in Majorca and in Roth a few years ago where it was seriously sweaty and hot. But it was awesome. Sarah Crowley, you've also been awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on the show and I wish you every success with all of your racing, whenever that may be again, and all of your training and I look forward to seeing you uh, once again as a champion running down an Ironman finish line that'd be brilliant yeah and I will try and make it one day out uh, over there I'd love to I'd love to try and race um, 
it might, it might not be my best performance, but we'll see how we go. But yeah, it was a pleasure and um, yeah, nice to speak to you. Nice to meet you. Sure, you can always just come over for the Guinness and the whiskey and to learn some Irish. Oh yeah. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget you can get in touch with any feedback or guest suggestions by emailing me on trytalkingsport at gmail.com. And remember to tune in to our live Facebook chats on the Try Talking Sport page on Tuesday and Thursday nights at 8.30pm. If you are enjoying the shows, please pop a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Try Talking Sport Facebook page. Or simply share the show with a friend who might enjoy the content and be inspired, encouraged and motivated to passionately pave their way in endurance sport. Until next time, wash your hands, stay safe and stay at home.